<laughs> Hello and welcome to Small Things Brought Together. My name is Robin Love. Small Things Brought Together is an ongoing series of conversations with artists and others about their relationship to the creative process. These are long format conversations, meaning that we take our time as we talk about and look at work together. We have time to circle back, we have time to sit in silence, and we have time to change our minds. Small Things Brought Together is now in its fifth season, so if you are arriving for the first time, please check out our previous episodes. Everything's on YouTube. Every season has a playlist, so enjoy the rich content of artists talking about their creative process. Today, I am very excited to welcome Eva Mellis to Small Things Brought Together. Welcome, Eva. Eva is an artist based in Brooklyn and in upstate New York. She is that rare bird, a native New Yorker, <laughs> who works in ceramics and mixed media, photography, kind of everything but I would say put ceramic near the top of the list. So welcome Eva. The other thing I had written down, which I guess I will add is Eva is also a very reliable source of most excellent cat videos. So. <laughs> I didn't know if we were gonna mention that. Yeah, I couldn't help it. <laughs> and vice versa. <laughs> So Eva, um, that's a very short introduction. Is there anything else that you would love people to know before we get started? Um, I think uh, I'm not really sure. The best thing is probably really to just look at my artwork or, and talk about that. Or if you have questions, um, I wasn't prepared to say anything <laughs> at the it's beginning. Okay. So I'm kind okay. of, yeah. my mind is blank. Right okay. now. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I grew up in New York City. I grew up in Manhattan. I grew up, I always make a joke. I grew up 10 blocks from the Empire State Building or 15 blocks. <laughs> People, somebody recently went, ooh. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I grew up in New York City in the 70s. Uh, uh, you know, when it was, there was an economic downturn and um i think that growing up in the city uh was um i'm gonna say made me kind of an oddball that's why <laughs> um i yeah i grew up with around a lot of artists my whole life and um lived with artists went to school with artists so I was really lucky in that respect. Um, growing, I grew up with a family that loved art and artists and understood being an artist and were kind of bohemian and themselves. And so that was pretty, I guess I was very lucky that way because I've heard people talk about, you know, their parents not, I grew up with my grandparents, not my parents and my siblings. Um, but people growing up with, and they were very kind of unusual, extremely unusual, energetic and uh, joyful, you know, all different kinds of things, <laughs> not just joyful, but um, complicated. Yeah. But, um, you know, loved art and loved artists and they were, native New Yorkers themselves and pretty, I'd say pretty sophisticated in the, in understanding all types of worldly things. Um, I guess I'm being a little vague because I'm doing that on purpose, but. <laughs> That's okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, I certainly can appreciate, um, well, when I came to New York, when I was 18 to go to Cooper Union, 
I met for the first time people who grew up in households like you're describing, which was totally foreign to me. Um, and it blew my mind to think that there were kids who grew up looking at art and listening to conversations about art. And yeah, so it's, um, yeah, it's you, you are one of those people that blew my mind. <laughs> So, you know, I also want to say just because of where you're sitting and the artwork behind you that another um, quality that you have, Eva, is that you are a great supporter of other artists and you really um, actively collect and do trades with other artists. And I so appreciate that, that you're really interested in what people are doing and supportive. So I'm going to put that out there too. Well, I've also felt like there's, um, this sounds kind of terrible, but maybe it's not. Um, I shouldn't put myself down so much. Um, I, there have been a lot of opportunities, great opportunities growing, you know, for both of us, um, having artist friends that are struggling along to, you know, do their artwork and they might need to sell something. <laughs> And so I've also sometimes gotten things very cheap and felt lucky uh, to be able to own these beautiful things and help them too at the same time. I do, yeah, I really, I, I think I love women um, a lot. I always have. And um I think women artists need support. I need support. We all need support. And, um, but I don't, I think it just comes, it's not anything I think about. I just kind of, but thank you for saying that, Robin. That really makes me feel fantastic. So thank you. I, I appreciate it. I feel yeah. like I want to, like, I know. Children, you do I a, a lot like of a tour of your collection all over the place. <laughs> yeah, so many. Some actor friends of mine made, and oh, of John and I, yeah, and Vivian, my daughter's artwork, and yeah, Fran Willing, yeah. and I even have a Kiki Smith there. Wow, yeah, <laughs> and that's my something I made. And oh, I could go back to Anne Marie's. Robin, I have your stuff upstate. Some of your things. <laughs> Anne Marie was the subject of the first season. Yeah, of brought Anne together. <laughs> By the <And> way, <laughs> yeah, my husband's work, right, and work. some other work up here. Yeah, a portrait of myself over there. Anyway, so yeah, I do have. I like displaying. Um, and my friend Regina Tuzzolino, I have a, a beautiful painting of her. She's an artist that uh, I think was one of the most talented people I've known, but she's now writing mm -hmm. um, and working for Google, I think, <laughs> <laughs> or, or some or Yahoo or something yeah. <laughs> in Vancouver, Canada. Oh, huh. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I think um, this idea of you know because. Uh, you and I were really the part of the driving force to create Whammer, Women Artists Meeting, Eating, Reading uh, Artists Group uh, that's been together for over 25 years. And so I feel like that's an extension of your sort of community building, supporting artists and and yeah, being part of countering this idea that artists work alone in their studios and are these sort of heroic individuals, but actually we're all dependent on each other. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Did you want to say? <laughs> oh, I was thinking about some, um, like a long time ago, 
in the early 90s about doing um, one of the first things like curating was um, doing some shows in women's health clinics in the Bronx and in on the Lower East Side and um, putting artwork in there. Um, I remember somebody, Beth Reset, somebody I went to graduate school started that and um, and then I, she got me involved in it and then I started curating it. And that was kind of one of my first, I think, curatorial things that I did, but just kind of like organizing artists. And I mean, I'm not a curator. I think of myself as an artist, but things that I think I just usually do things that just come along and. Um, yeah, well, you recently co-curated an exhibition of Tasha Depp's work up at the Woodstock Birdcliff Guild in Woodstock, New York. Mm -hmm. And you and I have curated things together, including an exhibition mm -hmm. at Queen's Theater in the Park. <laughs> that was sometime. Nature hanging on a string. Yeah. And we did that in the mid-90s before anybody was even thinking about I mean, of course, there were people thinking about um, the environment, but we were really worried about it, and everybody seemed to be la di da <laughs> or not thinking about it at all. Um, that was a great experience to do that. And we both gathered a lot of artists to do that. That yeah, was a big <clears throat> show, actually. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess that also points to another. It was, it was in a beautiful place, too, the uh, Old World's Fair grounds in yeah Kansas with the big it's, giant globe <laughs> that's really right the 60s queen's theater in the park is in that from the first it's in a building from the first world's fair that was in flushing meadows but i think it's all been renovated i don't believe that space exists as it was anymore so and robin you were the cure you were the director or curator of that space and you also worked at the print shop too the yeah Lawrence print shop like you, I guess we both were, have, had been doing a lot of kind of things with our community and having people come in, you know, kind of uh, collaborating. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I like to do things with people. I, it's more enjoyable for me to do things with, with other people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and and I think uh, you know the show we did together. Um, it was also that also highlights another thread that sometimes is more prominent in your work and sometimes less, which is your strong environmental um, convictions of the state of our uh, world being in crisis. Um, yeah. So yeah, another I say yeah. my work when people ask me, I usually say I'm a ceramic artist to keep it simple. <laughs> and um I uh, am concerned about the environment. It, I'm it I my work is about the environment and feminism. Feminism number one. And um well they're both, I mean, I well, the environment is more important <laughs> than anything. Um so yeah yeah and i actually think environment like concern this current state this current crisis uh in the with our uh natural world i feel like is not in any way unrelated to the current state of patriarchy and misogyny i think they're completely related so feminism and environmentalism seem very connected to me So it doesn't feel like a stretch at all. All right, on, maybe on that. I have, yeah, I have other <laughs> thoughts about that too, but yeah. Anyway, <laughs> well, maybe I we'll... agree, I, they're, they're connected and I have other ways that I think about them being connected. Okay, all right. But, uh, also, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let me bring the slides back to the beginning. I'm gonna share my screen so we can start to look at your work. Oh, no. Okay, wait. Yes, okay. And maybe what I will do is start the slideshow. 
Okay. So just to preface a little bit, this work, um, maybe you can tell us, it spans several decades. So some of the work is like very early work and some of it is more recent. Um, and and I don't, it's not arranged chronologically. So, so we're gonna jump around, I think a little bit. Yeah, later. I originally gave you them chronological and you mixed them <laughs> in an interesting way that I thought would, is good. <laughs> So yeah, some of the, the work ranges from the 80s, the early 80s till now. Yeah, yeah. Just to get a sense of like, yeah, your breadth of practice in terms of decades. Yeah. I guess I, I wanted people to know like, who's watching this, where I was coming from, where, where I've been and yeah, not so much where I'm going, but where I've been. Yeah. Yeah, so this piece is, um, well, why don't you talk about it? It's, they're ceramic. Yeah, uh, they are actually Sculpey female. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And they're tiny shoes that I made in 1980 to 1983. It's a hundred pairs of shoes. And um, it took, they took me two years to make. I mean, that's like with a job and going to school, yeah. college. Um, and doing my other work and um, I this is kind of where I started kind of my style or my way of working is where it and even the work all of it kind of even what I'm doing now stems from this type of work mm -hmm. um, I'm going to show a detail a couple details yeah so people can see these are very small I've seen them in person what are they maybe an inch and a half yeah they're about less. an inch and a half each yeah and um I've shown them they were in um I've shown them kind of around the world in a weird way because I was involved with this um uh, gallery Christine Rose and she had a shoe show in the, um, I think it was the mid nineties. Yeah. And um, it traveled to Asia, the show and London. And I think uh, a few other places I have it listed, but, and I showed them a lot um, in the city and different places. Um, and, and what, you know, when you, was it like you were just messing around and, and one day you made a pair of um, shoes and went, oh, I think I want to make 99 more or yeah, you have this idea? Like, I was thinking about like this, how um, you interview people and you want to talk about the process and how the creative process, but yeah, they felt like they came out of nowhere, like uh, just intuitive. I just started making, I made one and then I made another one and, and uh then when I made had made a bunch, people were pretty wild about them. And uh, oh yeah, I showed them at Visual Arts. I went I went to Cooper Union Visual Arts and Rutgers for my masters. And when I went to Visual Arts, they actually gave me a show in Soho, which was the art center of New York at the time, in their gallery. And I showed with um, a schizophrenic artist, a painter who did paintings of gorillas with green moons. And mm -hmm. I think that they felt like these were pretty, at that time, um, the art, there was a lot of minimalism and uh, it just, people, the art world wasn't conceptual art, um, but not really things like this. I think people were pretty kind of shocked by them actually. And, there are people that still remember them from years ago that I, um, but I think it, you know, in retrospect, or no, even then, I think it has to do with growing up in New York and seeing, I always loved clothing and seeing all the different things that people wear. And I always, at that time, if you, it was so kind of, everything was so stuck up kind of like, um, 
clothing wasn't considered an art form. Now it is like, these are kind of, to me, it's almost like things it's passe, but at that time they were kind of shocking. So it's, it's just kind of, uh, that's what I, I don't know. Yeah. I could. Thank you for, for bringing that up because I think it's easy for people to either not know or to forget that at that time, um, you know, really painting was king, <laughs> you know? And if you were a serious artist, you were really a painter and that people, anyone doing anything, particularly using materials that were considered crafty or um, like you say, referencing clothing rather than some kind of high-minded conceptual thing. Um, yeah, there was a lot of snobbery around that that doesn't exist anymore, it seems. Yeah, and Clay was out. Clay was yeah. absolutely like a no-no, like don't do Clay because it's, it's craft. Um, yeah. There was something else I was thinking about when you were, but now I forgot. I oh, actually God. thought you said play was out. P -L oh, play. Yeah. <laughs> clay that and play, out. though. That was, <laughs> oh, I know what I was going to say. In 1979, 1980, they were saying painting is dead at that time. They were saying, no, painting, no, not even painting. It was really like a, an obliteration of any kind of imagery. And doing figurative work was also a no-no. It was... It was just not, you know, yeah. Yeah. It was very, uh, very strict rule. It was still like uh, Greenberg, the critic Greenberg kind of feeling of, you know, um, very tight rules about what art could be. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like older than you are, Rob. I think I'm like four or five years younger I mean older excuse me than you are and um <clears throat> so it was even more uptight yeah yeah so just to to kind of highlight even more the radical nature of this piece to to put that out there at this time yeah every aspect of this piece is for, in its time was like really radical and kind of thumbing your nose at everything that was the miniatureness too yeah yeah instead of what people were making giant paintings if they're when they were painting I mean there were plenty of painters and you're yeah. right I, painting has always been but um yeah I was painting too I was a painting major in uh, hmm. college so hmm. Yeah, I mean, well, I guess like my question would be like, was that because you loved painting or was it because that was sort of what everyone was expected to do? Uh, I did love painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love drawing, I uh, painting, but I clay was more my forte. It was just something that I had always done since I was really, really little, like ridiculously little, you know, like three years old. You know, I just love clay. And cool. um, so I had always, yeah, I had taken, uh, I had a, a mentor who was a ceramic artist, a jeweler. She was um, Jewish from Germany, East Germany, and came to the United States. And um, I took ceramics classes with her. Um, her classes were in the projects on 26th Street in the basement. And um, I then would help her. Um, I didn't live in the projects, but I, I went to the classes there uh, where Anne Zondek was her name. She passed, has passed away, um, had a ceramics class. And so I, my grandparents knew I loved clay when I was little. So they, I knew her from when I was seven until oh, wow. adulthood until you know we became friends and um yeah she she was absolutely hilarious actually she was she had a great sense of humor she wanted to work for the community and um, had fan amazing art classes 
of clay classes after school uh, program. And I later on, I would help her. Um, she'd asked me to come and help her sometimes in the when I got into high school. And um, she was an amazing person. And I think sometimes that these may have come from her because I didn't realize it at the time. But I did tell her before she passed away, I said, Anne, you know, I think those shoes that I did might have come the because she told me she would crack up about this crazy friend she had who had a lot of shoes in her closet, all different kinds of shoes. And I thought, oh, maybe that stuck in my mind. And I didn't realize it at the time because they really felt like they were coming from the air. Um, and also people didn't have, when I made the, in the seventies and eighty. well, I made these in the eighties, but even in the eighties, people didn't have as many material goods as they do now. I think the nineties was when people, Americans started having too much stuff, <laughs> but then it wasn't, it wasn't like that. It was harder to get things. Yeah. Um, so, and that I also question now about the whole, you know, because these are um, about, I guess they are, they can be looked at as materialistic or I think I am materialistic. <laughs> um, I like things I like, uh, you know, I love vintage stuff the most. Um, recy it's recycling, but it's also history. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, and fashion is, I love fashion and fashion is very creative. And I, there are a lot of great artists that are in the fashion industry. Yeah. Too, so. Yeah. But it's yeah. not just about fashion. It's about a lot of other things. Yeah, exactly. There are things about these shoes that I, I won't say. Okay. <laughs> I mean. Too personal for me to. Yeah. Handle. As it should be, I think. But also I think about like. um. Yeah, just like, well, we, when you were saying clay and I heard play, part of me was thinking of this because it's so playful and yet it's also contains all these other um, more serious, I guess, if you want to call it like that. But, but, you know, I think play can be serious too. So, and I think that is another aspect that runs through your work is even though you're, you're hitting these um, important topics about women's rights and feminism and environmentalism and providing a counter to sort of a patriarchal narrative in art. Like, I think the fact that there's always kind of this sense of humor in it is is doing all of that actually just by because like oh, they're yeah, funny you know, they're you're, kind of funny <laughs> you're reminding me also that humor was also out when these yeah. were, um when I made these humor was a no-no humor was a no-no clay was a no-no miniature was a no-no it's not anything I was thinking about I was really just in my own world it wasn't like I was thinking oh I'm gonna make this thing sure. you know I didn't have all those pre it's preconceived ideas it's just they came uh it's just something I think about, oh, that's why people were kind of like, well, what is that? <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's just, um, well, let's keep going. So um, yeah, so like you said, I did kind of rearrange these a little bit, which I guess is my prerogative. <laughs> so yeah. So, um, yeah, I kind of got hooked on to this idea that yeah, so I'm really seeing all your these like threads that run through your work. There's the sense of humor, there's the feminism, there's environmentalism, and there's also this idea of collecting that a lot of your work references or is an actually well, presenting collections. Yeah, so, I like color too. Um, I love color. Hmm. I'm wearing black shirt, it's like, why am I gonna wear a black shirt? <laughs> um <Yeah>. I <laughs> this though is like really makes me sad this piece it's not funny at all this yeah, is one yeah. of my most recent pieces um I made it uh two years ago mm -hmm. maybe already two years ago and um I found a book on the street of South American birds 
from 1919, excuse me, 1976. And I just had this, it was a beautiful book because the person who did it, they caught the birds, they photographed them. They said it was a huge amount of work for whoever made this book. Oh, well, I have the title and everything, but I don't have it right next next to me, the credit for who took these photographs because they're artistic, actually, the photograph. But I just had this incredible desire to cut it up. And I had the book for years and I finally had the time to do it. And this was actually hard to do to cut the because the pictures were all different sizes. Mm -hmm. um, but it just I just wonder how many of these birds are left you know, wow. in South America, there were right. so, it's just unbelievable how many, there were more birds than this in the book. Mm -hmm. I had to cut up, I had to pick the page. I only cut up basically maybe two thirds of the book because I, when I would cut the page, birds would be on the other side. And, right. Um, right. but it was really fun to cut them up and look at them and look at all the different birds and um, just the beauty of them, you know, and but you also felt this heartbreak. I, I feel heartbreak when I look at, when I look at any animal pictures these days, I feel heartbreak because when I was born in 1961, there were, there was no problem with the wildlife. And now it's, there's so many extinct animals and we're just pounding away, trying to kill everything else that it's just terrible. I mean, not there's it's complicated i mean there are good there are wildlife places and and great things that are people that are that people are doing um but we have to keep it up we have to and i try to be very active as i can with signing petitions i give money like twenty dollars fifty dollars a hundred dollars to different organizations every year um if i can't go out and march someplace um because I'm really, really, as many of us are worried about the um, environment and climate change and yeah. that affects the birds, you know? Yeah. The, I just heard about um, all these birds that got killed in Chicago, I think it was. They hit a, hit a skyscraper. Oh gosh, really? that is such anyway, a- Anyway, that's the black hole of, yeah. like, that's what this <laughs> right. piece is about. Yeah, well, you know, I guess, um, you know, there's, so there's something to like, kind of like with the shoes where it's just like this repetition of an image that in this case, nature has provided the variations, but you know, you've assembled them all together and the power is in the repetition. I feel of it's biodegradable. Um, the artwork is biodegradable. Yeah. And, you know, it actually kind of makes me think about, well, first off, you got the book off the street and um, a piece that we don't have an image of, but was part of a project that we were in together um, with another artist, um, uh, where you made these boats out of paper, basically paper garbage. Um, and you just made these amazing... Uh, like ships out of them yeah there's so much you know when you get to be like our age although I'm older than you and I should stop talking about this um how old I am um there's so much work that I I kind of narrowed it down to certain things but there are a lot of different avenues that I went down yeah but I guess just like the material of it and just like well and we have another um piece Maybe I'm going to skip ahead to this one, which are coffee cups, many of which you find on the street. That's from around 2012. And um, oh, my God, the most amazing thing about this is that for me is that I had this. These are paper coffee cups because I was so. When I made it, I just I was just didn't want to make more things to add them to the world. Um and so I thought I'll make something that can biodegrade. And so I put fabric on some of these. I had, and also I wanted to do something that was just fun because, so yeah, I found, and I've been collecting these since like the early nineties. I've been collecting yeah. these. So I've been collecting them for like 30 years. I still am collecting them. Um, but some of them have fabric, some of them have lace, some of them have beads and 
uh, jewelry on them. Some of them have collage. Some of them are found. Some of them are words that I, my husband helped me put the uh, words on them because they had to wrap around. So that's right. Uh, my favorite one though, is one of my first coffee cups that says oil on it. Oh, there it is. That was one of the very first ones. Oh, there it is. And um, I, that was about addiction or addiction to oil and you know, that we're basically uh, eating it. And we're basically drinking, you know, imbibing oil with the plastic and all the stuff that the chemicals that are in our body. And yeah. Um, so, and I, yeah. And we drink coffee every day. <laughs> so I thought it, yeah. 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 This was, yeah, and I was lucky to have that in the New York Times that a photograph of that because they they came to see Sasha Chavchavadze's space, uh, which Robin, you were involved in. I was involved in at uh, Proteus Gowanus in Brooklyn, which is no longer. Sasha was an amazing support. She's another person. She really supports artists and she's an unbelievable. And she, she, um, her space was closing after many years and the New York Times came and luckily I had my piece there and they, they took a picture of it. Yeah, I remember that. Portrait yeah. of her <laughs> and her, <laughs> and her wonderful friend. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we had a space within Proteus Gowanus called BKBX. Brooklyn box yeah we're a cooperative for a little while yeah a couple, a couple of years. years you had a couple of one-person shows or one yeah person. yeah it was it was a great opportunity yeah so and then um this piece is another I mean you know talk about durational art like you're collecting things over years if not decades these are photographs of people that you've encountered on the street or other places where you like their look just some of them yeah some of them are artists too um there's the artist sana in there and paula la 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 oh, I is think in I there. um but sam korzak who was an amazing crazy wild artist who went, I think she might be living either in New Hampshire or Italy now. Um, she was a great inspiration to me uh, with photographs, actually, with incorporating them into my artwork. She was the one who I was like, oh, that's something you can do, um, which may seem obvious to a lot of people, but for me, it was kind of, you know. Uh, yeah, but these people on the street, I'm in New York mostly New York City yeah. older women younger women flea markets <laughs> some men yeah some trans probably yeah yeah this is uh I put this in because it's an art photograph because uh -huh. I also have my another another avenue I go down is photographs I print them out and people really like them and uh, this was a photograph of a vintage shop in Knoxville, Tennessee, where some of my family lived. And um, I mean, I'm moved from New York yeah. City. There were yeah. New Yorkers that moved down there. Um, but they, uh, I, I just really like this photograph. Um, I, it's just the mannequin. It's like that's her house that's, that's <laughs> no. like a like a giant doll or something in a dollhouse really... I'd rather not say even why I like all these things I don't like to say well, too much I'd rather I mean... prefer people just interpret them themselves and I well, hope when I was putting these it. together I was like well I don't really 100% understand why this is in here but like it fits yeah. so okay like I don't need to know <laughs> yeah I think it's the figure that um as a matter yeah, of fact, but, I know that that's why I put it in is because yeah. I, the pictures I gave you were based on the figure. And that was yeah. another thing that was out 
too when I was doing I think I've always liked to do things that people don't um like when I was in high school or junior high school I would never wear blue jeans I couldn't everybody wore blue I could not stand to wear a pair of blue jeans because so I I'm not that way now with my clothing but um with my artwork I feel like I can't stand to do what other people are doing because it bores me uh yeah. some people I love though when people do do things that like a landscape a beautiful landscape or a beautiful still life or a beautiful the most cliche if they're good they're good and I I don't make any rules about good or bad and I'm not making a rule about good or bad I'm just saying for me I like to try to I just like to make things that I feel like I don't think I've seen before mm -hmm. so yeah um, anyway and you had a whole series of photographs of like window displays and like sometimes I felt like the photographs maybe some of them even were some of your own collections and some of them were just like yeah. stuff windows that looked like it could have been one of your collections yeah. I think also this picture it's funny and spooky to me at the same time yeah because it's yeah. like dead like everything's there's nothing alive in that picture yeah but it looks like it's alive I yeah don't, I don't know there's a lot of things that I... yeah <laughs> okay so now we're going to switch a little bit um into the next few images are are a series of ceramic pieces um yeah that that are women yeah, this is a piece I made in 1992. I finished it in 1992. And um, I went to Kohler uh, Arts and Industry Program, which uh, Ruth Kohler, who's passed away, had started in the 70s, I think. And I was very lucky to go there. Um, and I, this is all cast uh, porcelain. So it really helped. Um, me, I had made a big figure before this, a life-size figure in 1988 to 1990. The red, it's in it was in a big red room. I don't know if you have, did you have a photograph of this or did you take that, that one out? Oh, that one. Yeah, that was the first one that I made. Oh, okay. So we could switch back to the, I don't know, we could do whatever yeah. you want. Um, yeah. um, but this was the first one I made and that's all hand built. It's life-size. And I made that when I was going to, getting my master's at Rutgers and um, there's some little figures on the wall back there there's velvet on the wall I always like fabric too um, and what are the, these up I, here? I guess huh is this what are these look like metal or something or yeah like those metal? are cigarette uh -huh. cigarettes um, and matchstick covers uh, there are matchsticks in there that are sex Mac uh -huh, sticks uh -huh. that they were all over the street and all over the place in the 80s and they were kind of edgy then a lot of this sex was edgy then but it's not now at all yeah right but it was very edgy to do um things that had sexual contact content in it yeah and kind of not acceptable in galleries and so much really it was another no-no but um yeah this piece is 1990 and there's um the black stuff coming from her head is oil mm -hmm. in my mind blood or oil and again it was I think before even Al Gore was talking about the climate I think I started getting concerned about the climate in around 1986, 80, 87, 88, maybe, um, because the weather, I felt it changing, getting warmer. Mm -hmm. And there was news in the 1980s about global warming then. There was news about it. Um, people didn't pay attention. Yeah. Um, I so I was yeah. very concerned. And also, you know, this piece is, uh, well, I think I'm going to just say the obvious thing is like about um, the obvious, I think it's about more things than this, but 
the obvious things are domesticity, like women's work. Um, the cup, the cup on the top says, um, I think it's a pleasure to serve you. It's about feminism, um, domestic and the things that are, it's all liquids, um, and flu, you know, detergents, mm -hmm. milk, ketchup, mm -hmm. a baby bottle. It's also about fertility, I guess. I guess I was thinking about fertility. I hadn't had any kids yet. And um, the cough, the the cardboard boxes are boxes I found on the street because uh, in front of grocery stores and things like that. And I was kind of amazed at how they looked um, feminine. The imagery mm. was very... Mm. I think I threw all those cardboard things out, but <laughs> at least I have it in a photograph. Um, yeah. yeah, but it's all handmade. So it took like two years. Each of these pieces take took a long time to make. Um, yeah. So all the items in the in this sort of shelf cabinet piece you made handmade uh, or uh, uh, yeah. cast. I made molds um, for each one. I did something really stupid when I went to Kohler. Instead of making one mold, which is what, I don't think it was stupid, but it was a lot of work. And a lot of artists would make one mold and then make a, a some type of installation. But I made like, I don't know, 200 molds. Like it was the hardest thing. I did the hardest thing and I had all these molds and um, made different pieces. I still yeah. have them, which is nice. That the is head good. mold, I have a mold for that head. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, so so we'll just pop back here. So you made this and then you that was this was previous to that other one that I yeah. just talked about. And um so this was my first life size. I had always kind of made these puppet type of things, even when I was with uh Anne in her ceramics class when I was a kid, I made all these doll and puppet things, um, movable things. And uh, she was very into puppets and stuff like that. I think from being into, from East Germany and East Eastern Europe circus, she was into the circus. Um, so I think I got influenced by that, but I made, um, I don't know. I mean, so I, the little ones are little miniature ones. And then, but this that I'd made in the eighties, like in 1985, 86. And this I made in 1988 to, 1990 uh -huh. um and so it took a long time to make and um it's a very super feminist piece yeah about and I don't know what I mean I don't really know um I think it's about a lot of things it's about therapy <laughs> sitting in a chair um <laughs> about history about fertility about women's strength, uh, about the unknown. About yeah, you also life. referenced the house and the sort of the body as a. Oh yeah, like a house or a. It's container. a big one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a yeah. That was I think Louise Bourgeois. I think she's one. You know. If, who are my favorite artists or who influenced me then? I don't know who my favorite artists are now because yeah. there's so many great artists and yeah. even just my friends can be, you know, yeah. but uh, I think Frida Kahlo was a huge influence and, um, and Louise Bourgeois. Yeah. And um, I loved. Uh, yeah. Uh, another huge influence for me was the California artist who did, installations what was his name oh my god um really great artist a male artist uh-huh heavy duty things then he had his wife working with him i who was he who what's his name he was a, he, i loved his work um so this was from, from 1985 and um i was living like on the lower east side in a in a I called the honeymooners apartment with the view of the brick wall. <laughs> I had no money. And so I think it was, yeah, a desire to have a nice place to live. And, you know, I was very young. I was like 25, 
24 or 25 when I made this. Oh, wow. How big um, is this piece? This is, um, it's about, a, I'd say a foot and a half. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So significantly smaller than the other ones. Yeah, that, it's, a, it's miniature. It's like, or... it came from the shoes. Uh-huh. And, oh, yeah, I have, this is something I made. I was going to, told you I was going to show some things. Okay. I don't know if I should show it let later. Me, well, let me, uh, I'm going to stop the share so we can see it. Better. So this is a necklace that I made. I'll put it, put it on. Um, <laughs> around the same time. Oh, wow. And this is porcelain. Oh my God. It's oil paint and they're all little houses and hearts and all that. So I always like necklaces and jewelry and it's just part of the clothing and thing. Yeah. That's and even more recently, like you were, <laughs> but even more recently, you're sort of, you've become an expert in custom vintage jewelry. Yeah, from another dear friend to antique dealer friend, Andrea. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, kind of spanning a from, lot. from uh, inventing your own to actually, you know, knowing. Um, okay. And, yeah, so this is one more that's also. This is, yeah, I started working on this after the. Um, that other one is called Smooth and Tasty Box. And this is called Eve of Deconstruction, that the uh, that one. Uh -huh. After this one, then I started working on that one. And that's called Eve of De Deconstruction. Uh -huh. And I showed that a lot. And I even showed it at White Columns. They had a, a burrow, a show of the burrows. And they picked artists that lived in the outer burrows, like Brooklyn and Queen. And at that time, then I was living in, in Brooklyn. And um, it's, I started working on collecting the pieces in, um, I guess the late eighties, I started collecting things and somebody, John, my husband, somebody, a friend of his, John Ag, <laughs> uh -huh. he brought home from Florida. He gave John as a joke, a little lighter from Florida. And it was like a, a lighter with a woman, no head and just a torso and I thought oh my god how weird and surreal and sexist and hilarious this thing is and so it influenced me in making I collected and then I um, made my own my interpretation of sex novelty objects so I collect I collected them and I also made my own yeah, I mean, so this piece includes things that you collected, but you didn't actually make. And was that the first time? It's, yeah, it's both. I think I had always kind of done that combined uh, things I found with things that I, you know, made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like the house, that house puppet has things on it that are found oh. objects um yeah this one does and then the next um not that one that one's completely yeah but, but that, that one the one I did before it had a lot of found mm -hmm. things like the gas in the red one <laughs> the gas pump do you see the gas pump yeah yeah that next to her so that's another like environment I was thinking about yeah. the environment there too and I thought it looked like a penis i'm like oh my god <laughs> um and then the vacuum cleaner thing that looks like a vagina yeah um huh. and the there's the hanger we love right. our customers that was about abortion yeah for me i'd rather i i i would and the giant lighting thing on top looks like a vagina yeah too <laughs> Yeah, and then this like hollow center right in the middle. That opens up. Oh wow. The it opens, it's a door and it has furniture on the inside. So it has shelves on the inside. It's uh -huh. all clay though, made made uh -huh. out of clay. Wow. 
Yeah, it's really fascinating how. And it was displayed in a big red room. And mm -hmm. um, my, uh, my the students that I was going to school with, a few of them helped. They said, I said, oh, I'm going to paint the room. They said, can we help? And they helped. And it was really sweet. It was wonderful. Okay, so welcome back. Uh, we got slightly interrupted by life. And so we're coming back. I'm coming back with Eva Mellis. And um, we have some more work to look at. Thank you, Eva, for coming back. And be oh willing. God, thank you for letting me come back. <laughs> yeah, so we had a few days in between to sort of digest. This doesn't always happen. Uh, it has happened a couple of times that we had some time to just digest everything that came in that first conversation. And we have some more work to look at. But um, maybe before we do, I'm going to share again my screen so that we can um, we can reconnect with where we were, which was kind of finishing up the series that you made of constructions that are, I guess you would say, multimedia. I'm just going to close that out. Where am I? <laughs> Getting confused here. Why won't this go away? Here we go. Um, yeah, these constructions that are primarily uh, ceramic, but not exclusively, and that are women's women, right? Um, let me just start the slideshow here. Yeah, that, oh yeah. There we go. <laughs> I don't know about how you are over there, but there's been a lot of rain and somehow that always affects the internet here. Oh yeah, and Whoa. mood, my mood. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, if we go back to the one I did in 1990, the red one, um, I had forgotten to mention that it was a lot also about just like objects and things dragging people down, you know, like things that we, um, Oh, you know, I've always been interested in hoarding. And um, so that's a little bit about that too, like things just kind of dragging us down to the earth, too many objects, too many things. I actually interviewed artists myself in the early nineties before those hoarding shows and all that stuff and what they even knew hoarding was. Like they didn't, even, there wasn't even a an awareness so much of the illness of it and, um. But I think a lot, we all kind of, hoard, a lot of us hoard things. It's just something that we do, hunting, gathering, hunter gathering -ers. Um Well, I mean, I guess the question for me is like, oh, so why why is that interesting to you? You know, and, and I have other yeah. thoughts about being artists and and sort of like, I don't I don't know any artists who, who can't hoard things just because there's always this idea, well, I'm going to use it in some way, you know, in the future. Yeah, um, well... At that time, I was kind of interested in why people like things, like why are you attracted to certain objects? That's and I interviewed people and I went through their house or their mostly their house, and uh, we looked at things in their house, and I asked them why they liked <laughs> certain things, and what was the draw to it? What was like because people have trouble getting not holding on to things mm -hmm. so why is that because they're like these man-made things that are not alive you know it's not like you're in nature and you're um they're inanimate objects and um so i yeah i there's just a lot of things that go through my mind with that but um i'm kind of blanking out right now uh anyway it so yeah. i i interviewed people but i also um think that it's now this is like how many years later oh god 20 20 wait 1990 so 1992 is it 30 years yeah shockingly oh my god so 30 years later there's all this stuff about hoarding and books about not you know trying to get rid of stuff and there wasn't all that then right. 
Right. And um, so now I think about it more as like people should really appreciate every object. It's kind of, which is what hoarders do, do. <laughs> they do <laughs> too much. They appreciate yeah. things too much, yeah. but um, yeah. so that it doesn't, but it's like, we have like a throwaway culture. I remember in the 90s, it was like insane how much stuff was being produced and how cheap everything was. And I remember hearing um, a woman saying that her daughter and, and son-in-law were throwing out all the new furniture that they had bought like five years ago and getting all new furniture, which was not something that we grew up with. I mean, it was just... Um, and it's still kind of like that. I mean, I don't know. But anyway, I that's another black hole <laughs> to go down. <laughs> um, but just environmentally, now I think, like I'm really have been into vintage stuff. And um, it's a lot of nostalgia, but um, also uh, just appreciating things, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I, I could talk a lot about that, but I don't know if I want to. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I guess I'm I'm thinking about like um the thingness of your work, which is you you use ceramic to kind of recreate man-made objects, shoes, you know, little souvenir things, whatever. Uh, you know, and you photograph, you know, people wearing clothing I don't know there's this quality like you're clearly attracted to man-made things yeah Even I think I said before materialistic I guess I and oh. I don't think it's a I yeah I mean it's 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 bad I that as a negative hmm? It's not a negative. It's just yeah. you know, it, even you know because because underneath yeah. all of that is this like clearly heartfelt, genuine concern, even alarm at the state of our natural environment. So, like your love and attraction for all these man-made things or human-made things, let's call them, and and I don't know. It's it's a very interesting tension to me. Yeah, it's a complicated subject too because we're it's it has been what has drawn us away from nature, like the fact that we make things, and um, you know, big time. <laughs> yeah, so um, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh oh, you know, I also wanted to mention two artists, other artists that I really love, which is um. Oh my God! Now I'm blanking out again. Um, <laughs> oh, I wrote them down. Uh, I love Diane Arbus and I still do. I always have. She was like a New York, New Yorker that took pictures of odd people, people that were kind of outliers. And um, her, I just love her photographs so much. And then, um, and there's a more recent artist that they found, a photographer that a vintage, a vintage person found her work she's really famous incredibly famous now she's like one of the most famous photographers she had a diane arbus type of thing although i like diane arbus more i think because much much more i think because of the new york city mm -hmm. uh thing and uh and then uh ed keenholz was who i was trying to think of before uh-huh i see that yeah. i loved his work and then i thought about there was an artist that passed away um Karen Dougherty who was a ceramic artist who was amazing and um she made figurative funny sculptures um but they had depth a lot of depth to them and um she was amazing I just want to mention her uh, yeah there's, there's so many great artists that you know there's so many talented people in the world and so many yeah you know, but those yeah. are anyway um yeah two artists and one unknown artist i mentioned <laughs> yeah well you know by referencing them you know there is something about obviously in your work that is a little bit 
weird, you know. <laughs> but also, and I I've been in reviews. You know, I've have had reviews here and there. Even in the New York Times, I had a review on that Eve of De Deconstruction piece from before, and they often they say oddball or something like that. Well, yeah, I mean, you had that Diane Arvis sort of like attraction to the to the oddball thing, and yeah, and, and this like humor, things. the humor. Yeah, Diane Arvis didn't really have humor, did she? No, Her no, it wouldn't dead. have worked if she had humor. I yeah, know. and neither were I. Don't think any of the artists that I've mentioned that I really love. Yeah, that's something I, I love these really serious artists, but my work. Um, like this particular piece, when I was in graduate school, um, I, the second year, what happened? I had a, sh a thesis show and then I was in a, cl a classroom with a bunch of students, graduate students that didn't know me or didn't know my work or anything. And somebody turned around. I did this piece in all seriousness. This, all of these pieces I do in all, no, no, not really. But a lot of now I think I realize that I have a sense of humor, but I don't think I really realized that, that I was funny or the pieces mm -hmm. were funny. I, mm -hmm. I so um some the artist turned around to me, the art student, she said, Are you the person that made that red piece? And I said, Yeah. She said, That was hilarious. <laughs> and I was like in shock like oh my god <laughs> I didn't realize that you know to me a lot of the subject matter is pretty heavy duty <laughs> so, yeah and even was, like I and, love it like you, you know well I like that you can laugh about that you know and, well I was looking at some of my old work too a, a while ago and I was like oh my god and I was laughing at myself <laughs> And I was like, oh my God, I'm a comedian. <laughs> like, you know. Um, but I think when we were talking before the second the first part of this talk, I was thinking afterwards, oh my God, I was being so serious. Like, I'm not really <laughs> um I because I am serious, I'm yeah. dead serious, but the work doesn't come out. I mean, to me, that's such a gift to like be really serious and sincere, but without becoming overly earnest or dogmatic, didactic, you know, and you can hold it lightly at the same time. That's really something, you know, and I think it it lets people Thank actually you. feel the seriousness when they don't feel they're being hit over the head or, you know, only being told how to feel, you know, one way. I mean, obviously, uh, I share this in my own work of like, if you can get someone kind of laughing a little, then that message can enter, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and I don't think um, either of us do it intentionally. It's just kind of like, although <laughs> now, though, I feel more circum circumspect. I feel more like I can see that I am. You know, now when I make work, I do think, oh, yeah, this is funny. This is funny. I might have always thought that this is funny. This is funny. But I didn't really. It's hard to explain. It wasn't like on my conscious. Yeah. Consciousness. It was in my subconscious somehow. Yeah. But now I'm pretty aware of it. Plus, that was another thing was that humor was not in the 90s or right. early 90s, 80s. It was not. Now, I keep making these generalizations, but of course there were artists that were had a lot of humor. But yeah. I think yeah. um yeah, a lot of the art world, I think I still come across that. I still come across oh yeah, like people not really understanding that there's can be humor in art. Yeah. Um, but it was really yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and uh yeah obviously for me that's I I love I mean for me yes I can look at this and it's it's actually a bit shocking and there's that but it's also to me it's funny also yeah this one I think is I don't more... mind having that 
holding both of those you know yeah I feel like this one's a little bit more um I mean you can't really see the detail but mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit more like a rotted out type of body like the head and the um it's like the somebody said to me when I I think I, I showed this at oh yeah somebody said to me um oh it's erotic or something and I was like I don't think so you know it's not at all it's kind of about the darker sides of sex I think yeah it's, I mean I feel there's like a darkness to this for sure yeah and it's, I'm sorry but like this thing at the top is kind of hilarious <laughs> so, yeah you know I mean this is sinister the hair but it's also like it's blue you know it's so uh I don't know. There's something uh, for me that's like highest praise, where it feels sort of at simultaneously like I want to laugh and be like, e yikes, what the, you know? That's very provocative to me in a good way. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> she's silent uh so this is oh, sorry uh, robin no, no. i i <laughs> feel like i yeah i didn't uh, that piece is yeah it's i don't know i don't i guess yeah. I, anyway this is a detail of um that's life size like uh -huh. a purse mm -hmm. um i did a lot of purses in the eight in the um i've always been into pocketbooks um and uh this was a pocketbook on that red hanging from the red figure yeah the, one, the, the woman in the red room right here yeah so yeah. i that kind of shows the size of mm -hmm. what it is yeah and um i think i had a lot of fun making this piece <laughs> for sure but it's also about heavy duty subjects yeah. all kind of smashed into one yeah violence addiction you know, self-destruction, love, yeah, gambling, <laughs> money. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I I don't think. I mean, this is my personal opinion, but I don't think having a bit of a a moment of laughing is is any diminishment of anything. For me, it's actually uh an elevation but you know that's me so i think i also liked um like with that one victorian the uh sometimes victorian imagery that had a lot of different symbolism in it uh-huh yeah and, there's um, almost like a tarot card feeling here. yeah i mean it's, the victorian stuff is very uh uh, it's it seems like the it had a lot of surrealism is in it and I don't know if it was like intentional or not intentional I don't know that's a whole interesting thing that I've never really read about or Victorian yeah. you know uh, even in postcards advertising or or just or art um, yeah yeah a lot of symbols well so. also in the victorian time yeah it was a lot of complexity i think in the victorian times because people didn't have televisions and everything that they have even books they didn't even have like i think books came out when in the paperbacks came out like in the 50s or the 40s yeah, yeah well certainly paperbacks yeah. like people didn't have like art was uh had to have a lot in it i right. think if it was to you know, or people put a lot into it, I think. But, you know, I was thinking about when you said that, like, um, you know, thinking about in England. So we're talking about in European, Victorian times, British times. Right. Like, you know, like George Eliot and and the authors so that George Eliot's like mid 19th century. I don't know. Is that Victorian times? Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> things came out in... Um, in the series so like her novels weren't weren't given out as books in the beginning they were they were came out in pieces and people subscribed 
and would receive them in pieces. Um, yes, because Dickens people that too, student. right? Yeah. Dickens yeah. was in yeah. the newspaper each week. His yeah, parts so, of his yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. All right. <laughs> so, so uh, this is one of my all time favorite pieces of yours. Thanks, Robin. I never really knew that you, I, I, so I never really it. knew you even liked. <laughs> oh my God. I love I, I haven't. Yeah. I thank you. Um, well, we both are cat fanatics. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe I, you know what? I, I think I read that there really isn't a, about um something that goes in your brain that makes you love cats that's not really true because i just thought maybe that's what it um yeah this is like a a piece that i uh an avenue i was going down of large sculptures on the wall that i've i'm not really doing now but um well uh oh I so the know. name of this is loyalty is mm -hmm. the title of this piece Mm. Mm. you know it's funny from the previous one I hadn't thought of this until like just now but when I you know thinking about like I said oh it's like a tarot card in the sense of like you know you're given this image with like a word or a, you know you, you the number of the tarot card in the suit but part of it is you look at the image and sort of it it, it creates a kind of stream of consciousness of like all these symbols and you can kind of read it based on the symbols and and knowing like oh this card is the whatever the hanged man or the empress or the whatever and so loyalty now I'm sort of seeing this differently you know originally uh, my reference was more like um you know when people hunt animals and just mount their heads on the wall and how horrible that is <laughs> but like there's something again okay. like to me a little funny about this piece because you have this giant heart that's like a charm and then this like because I know you love cats so much and so <laughs> like there's I don't know that these these I guess they're like bells but these balls and uh <laughs> I don't know walls and <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know that I that's what I love about this piece is like it's like it's all the things it's all the things yeah I was thinking I can't get too silly with Robin on <laughs> the interview we could really <laughs> go nuts <laughs> um yeah it was some. Um, a challenge to make too it was it's uh, earthenware a very hard earthenware oh you know i wanted to mention to male mentors or male men that have been great i don't you know i said i love women but there are a lot of you know great men like my husband john bauman and um but robert cook who was my um he was really a a great mentor at, at rutgers um he was my ceramic teacher, professor, excuse me. And he, the clay that I use for this, he helped me uh, develop a, a hard earthenware clay. He was amazing. He was really great. Um, and then, um, and then uh, Peter Leventhal, who was uh, art department head I had, who was wonderful. And my friend, Angelo Belfato, who is an amazing art painter ceramic artist who never wants to have anything to do with the art world or anything and he's incredible and he's always been a support there've been a lot, you know there's a lot of great men out there i just want to say yeah thank you for those are some <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you know just so you know what in after when this gets put on youtube we can have in the description some links to maybe some of the people that you're mentioning the artists and and these mentors uh if people want to learn more about them and their work uh so they can see that i should mention joan semmel too at uh, rutgers yeah she was um a mentor she was amazing feminist yeah i feel like it's getting sort of a a new interest in her work recently I and then see. I of course I have all my friends artists friends that I'm 
I think I'm going to maybe not mention my friends, but a lot of great, amazing friends that have been a support and probably my main support. So I should probably mention them. But yeah. anyway. <laughs> Well, I think we said we're in this uh, group whammer, women, artists, meeting, eating, reading, and for 25 years. And so uh, in that circle are some really incredible artists, all of us. Uh, yeah, strong, smart people supporting each other, which is how it should be. <laughs> yeah. And then I have other artists outside of that, you know, of course. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. It's good. You know, I was just talking actually with some other artists this morning and uh, we were talking about how, because of just capitalism, I guess we could say how artists especially can get into a real scarcity mindset of there's not enough. And so when other people, even our friends have successes, well, one person was sharing that like a, a, a good friend for a long time suddenly became quite jealous and hurtful. And, and I really just put that up to like, the scarcity thing, you know, we feel there's not enough to go around. I feel that, you know? Yeah, I think that that's exactly what it is. I think that that's an excellent um, point. Yeah, and you know, but I really love, you know, that I, I said earlier, like I just so appreciate with you, your support. Like when you're doing something, you're always like, who else can I bring in? And that feels so- That's because- they support me too yeah. right both yeah. it's feels good to to do something for somebody and then it feels good to have them are helping you and around yeah. and supportive and yeah you know That's it's important should. it's super important. but it's it's good to be able to I think very important to be able to, to do things where you're not it's not expecting anything out of it Right. So right. I don't really, I don't feel like I expect something from, you know, if I, yeah. <clears throat> that's yeah. where the environment comes in really import, uh, importantly, because, you know, we, there's, it's, you're not going to get an immediate <laughs> something coming back to you, but um, right. there's all sorts of, anyway, that's another yeah giving yeah <laughs> yeah that's another <laughs> whole thing <laughs> ah so this is a, a more slightly more recent piece um, yeah um this is um from i think 2012 so it's not that recent but what? for me it's recent <laughs> uh feels recent um yeah this was um a project that sasha chav chavadzi uh came to me, it was before Hamilton and all that, the Broadway show Hamilton and all that, where um, history was kind of um, uh, translated into art. Uh, so this was uh, the Battle of Brooklyn. Um, Sasha came to me and said, do you, you want to work on a project called the Battle of Brooklyn with me? And I was like, oh my God, I was shocked. I was like, what the heck is, what? I didn't really, which was great because she was making me, helping me think in a different way. She loves history. She had a gallery called, um, no, like an art space called Proteus Gowanus. It wasn't like a commercial gallery in Brooklyn. And um, so she said that she loves history and she also had a whole, she's a whole other thing. But anyway, if anybody wants to look her up. Um, so she said the space that her, uh, the parcel of land that her space was on, her gallery space was a major area where George Washington's, one of George Washington's most important battles happened. Um, actually, they they escaped, they ran, they didn't really battle the <laughs> English, but it <laughs> saved <laughs> the whole revolutionary war um by escaping and then uh, this was at the beginning of the war um in Brooklyn and so she wanted to do have artists and she had she's another person that 
loves to help artists and and she's a amazing artist herself um so, uh so she gathered artists and we all made and robin you were part of it indeed you, <laughs> you made some amazing i forgot what they were called and then you had people make them those uh things on the hats yeah. that they wore at that time um, what were they called do you remember <laughs> oh um, my God. and you had what people make them you figured out how to make them out of ribbon anyway yeah. so this was part of that project that we both worked on and um i guns have always been a very powerful uh image for me um I guess I don't want to get too personal, but, you know, I feel strongly about gun violence. And also with, with the Battle of Brooklyn and gun, how people, with all the mass shootings and everything, uh, and people base it on, you know, what the... um Oh my gosh, I'm completely blanking out. Anyway, in the 1700s, these are the kind of guns <laughs> right. that were made and were basing gun laws on, you know, something guns. it took three are, to reload every time. I don't even want to think about guns, but um, yeah, AK-47s yeah. or whatever, we're basing our, you right. know, laws yeah. and stuff on those when Makes people sense. are arguing that you know we all have gun rights but these are we these are the kind of guns that people had when those gun rights right. were made right and um yeah well i mean you know yeah this is a beautiful piece and i think the I, fact that it's like all white and it's a porcelain piece and that like it's so it's del it's delicate it's sitting on a pillow and yeah there's all this history of like you know these guns took however many minutes in between firing to reload and uh yeah i mean it, there's so much here to even say it all feels diminishing in some ways of like its it, power is it also has like a double meaning too which is about revolution too right and that you know i mean i don't know i think you could think about that too but yeah. um yeah and i remember that was part of the project right was this the different ways to think of that word revolution yeah yeah and oh <laughs> So this was um, a shot from a uh, my a friend of mine, Sam Korzak. She had a cable TV show for a little while. She was a great artist. I mentioned her before. And she said, do you want to make an ad on <laughs> my cable TV show? So I made a, a Red Lady um, advertisement. And I think she, I, I have the video. I, she baked a cake, red. She she did all this stuff in red in like a two minute thing and this was a character that I had made up when I was at um in graduate school um and I also did a project with um Thieves Theater uh Nick Fricaro and Gabrielle Schaefer they were have I had done many many projects with them and they were also supports um in art you know uh we did all sorts of crazy projects robin again you were involved you did a, a jello gun i think in a refrigerator that they loved um and yeah so i one time we had they had a refrigerator on the street in manhattan in a at that time it was a, a movie theater that was very um popular 
a lot of art films and stuff were played and they set up a refrigerator and put said asked visual artists to put artwork in it and if they wanted to do a performance along with it well, they did do perform performances and um so i i also had done the red lady with um them with that project where i put my ceramic artwork in the refrigerator and stood on the street and <laughs> um and you're you painted your whole body red just so you like people yeah understand this is yeah and that, just to give some more context like i don't know if it still even happens but back in the day people would just put their fridges out on the street and they would come around and take out the um whatever that stuff is called that makes it cold and uh <laughs> and so there'd be fridges on the street like you would walk down on the sidewalk there oh you see quite commonly like an old fridge on the street and so that was sort of their they were playing on that idea and then they yeah and we also burned a fridge we <laughs> we burned one which uh another uh, artist regina tuzzolino who was an am another amazing artist she um said why don't we we, they were trying to figure out an invitation for some show. I think we had we had shows in galleries too in Soho, also when so when that was the center of the art world, mm -hmm. and that was this was in the '90s again. And um, Regina said, "Why don't we?" So they they had the energy to get a refrigerator. We went out to some vacant lot and burned. I don't know how they burned a refrigerator, but we have photographs of that. <laughs> anyway. That's a whole other. They were pretty wild. Yeah. Are they're still? Yeah. Let's around. Just, yeah, they're still doing. It's called International Culture Lab, I believe. They're right. It's called. Yeah. And they're still really active and doing a lot yeah. of wild, wild stuff. Mermaid Parade, Coney Island. Yeah. Yeah. So and, yeah, this is a piece I made about I think six years ago. Um, but I had different, um, uh, evolutions of this piece. Um, I made it in paper first for a, a monochrome black bedroom that we all, again, you and I and Paula, <laughs> it was her brainchild. We, I made a black paper dress like this. And then I made a, for in my, I, ha I was in a show in Miami and, a uh, friend Michelle Weinberg a friend of mine asked if I would want to be in a painting show and I made one out of canvas a black canvas and then I made this one in ceramic porcelain and um it just it does fit with my body of work it's life size it's porcelain <laughs> and people often ask does... you put it on yeah <laughs> I guess you could put it on um <laughs> If you were shaped like a tree trunk, you could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess I feel like some, I'm being quiet because I guess I don't really like, I feel like if I say what it's about, I think a lot of artists probably feel this way. If you say what it's about, then people kind of block their mind off and they go, okay, that's what it's about. And don't right. think about all the other things that it could be about right you know yeah um, yeah but I think my work is pretty straightforward often I think it is but then I'm not I yeah. don't know like you said it's it's very multi-layered and you can come in in many in different places you know you come in on the color you can come in on the material you come in on the dollar sign you come in on the dress part of it you can you know like you can enter different ways and then see what happens from there capitalism <laughs> <laughs> right yeah yeah all right I'm gonna stop the share okay and just to say um you know you we focus a lot on your earlier work but you continue to make work and it was choice to not show some of it because it's in progress and you know, different artists have different processes of working and, and sometimes people want early engagement. It helps guide the work and some people don't and you don't. So people, uh, oh, so yeah. People, yeah. And so if people want to know or, or find more of your work, where 
can they do that? Um, they can Google me or uh, Instagram. Yeah, basically, Google me or or hashtag me on Instagram. I suppose there are pieces that come up. And you yeah. do have an Instagram, but so yeah, I feel like it's just hard to talk about work that I'm working on now. That it, yeah, that yeah. it just I'm it's too confusing to talk. Yeah. About. I'm yeah. trying to figure it out myself right now. <laughs> so. Yes, well, we'll look forward to uh, seeing it as it comes into fruition. Yeah. Now, I have a lot of pieces that I've made and I've shown yeah. after the red piece, but also we had a limited amount of uh, things that we could yeah. go over. So I didn't want to have too many pictures. Yeah, yeah. that feels fair. All right. So yeah, I hope people will follow Eva on Instagram and keep an eye out, particularly within New York City or the Hudson Valley, uh, which is where you spend your time and um, have been known to show work. <laughs> and, uh, Cat skills. Yeah. <laughs> any, any other things before we before we wrap it up? Anything else? Um, no, I think that we it's was fantastic. I just want to yeah. Thank you, Robin, very, very much. This was fantastic. This is a great experience. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, and we have to find somebody to interview you. <laughs> you need an interview on this, I think. <laughs> okay. We have to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's uh, it's been my pleasure, and I'm so glad that you were able to come on and share your work with us. Thank you. Thank you, Robin.